Welcome everybody to lecture 13, last lecture, Databases and Information Systems, the course that for one semester and one semester only can be taken as information retrieval. It will be two separate courses in the future. We will talk about your experiences with exercise sheet 12, which was about language models. Language models in one lecture, quite amazing. It's the last lecture of this semester, yay, of this course. Today we will talk about the official evaluation, information about the exam and uh, work at our chair. And usually there are more people in the room for the last lecture. There are over 200 registrations for the exam, about 20 people in the room. This decreases steadily over the year and I blame it all on social media, just so you know. And there are studies to back this up. And even some people in the room are occupied with their smartphones. You know who you are. There's no new topic and no new exercise sheet this week, but still an interesting lecture, and I think the, in particular the part about the exam. So, uh, very few. How many did the sheet, Sebastian? I didn't ask you before. Do you have an idea? 20 something. So 10% did the last sheet. So there will certainly be a, an exam question about the last sheet. So exercise sheet I had the most fun with. I mean, the exercises, I said it many times, they are the most important part. This is just a basic explanation, inspiration, a bit of entertainment. <laughs> you have to do the stuff to learn it. It doesn't work otherwise. Not sure what the other 90% are doing. Very or 80%, 20% do the sheets on average. Very interesting sheet, this time I read the hints. Congrats, intuition for language models in one lecture. Wow, yes, it was quite ambitious, but I did want to uh, show it because that's the state of the art. Nice exercise, quite challenging, and it effectively showed me that I don't quite understand this learning part yet. Yes, it was, uh, it was hard, uh, it was a bit, it was hard, it was a lot. I did some blind try, trial and error to fix torch errors. Using characters, the model still generates correct words, but struggles more to create coherent sentences and uh, way more time consuming. It depends, there were a few people who already did something with learning. I think it was, it was easier for them. Uh, others who have seen this for a first time, I mean, you did already learn it for the last exercise sheet did some learning, logistic regression, but if you did all this for a first time, it takes longer. There are all these small little details, experience stuff. I have some, uh, I have the master solution here, and we can, okay, I think I have to go in demo. Sebastian prepared this. So <coughs> what we have here, let me briefly talk, show you the data sets. That's a very exciting one here uh, to learn from. So that's just the alphabet <laughs> repeated, I don't know how many times, let's see, uh, 100 times. And let's see what the model learns. So let's make, uh, so that's the, we have already learned the model because that takes a few minutes or even longer depending how many epochs. So now I can enter something, A, B, C, and it's a language model. So given what you typed, I don't know, what's the context window here, Sebastian, for alphabet? Three, it's three. So given the last three words, uh, tokens, it predicts the next tokens, and this is a character-based model. So it will always predict character by character, and amazing, it learned the alphabet from just the alphabet. Let's start somewhere in the middle. Okay, not bad. It's actually not so easy. If I tell you the letter now, Q, what's the net next letter after Q? R, yeah, okay. D, oh, so it takes the time, okay, D. Okay, D, it starts with A, so yeah, it's a, okay, next data set. We just make this, the next one was uh, lecture transcripts, and those we gave to you. Uh, the other one, you could try yourself, whatever you want. That's just the transcripts of the lectures there on YouTube from this year and from last year. So just everything I said. Welcome everybody to lecture one. Information retrieval, that's in the 
So let's see what the model does here. <coughs> Make lecture. And let's first do the word-based model. So Sebastian trained two models, one word-based. So now it will predict word by word. And let's just type welcome. Let's see. Welcome everybody to lecture five. The other way to do it. Okay, you can. So it's just given again, what's the context here? Eight. Okay, given the last eight words, of course, I mean, uh, relatively small machines. This is on CPU, so the larger the context window, uh, the more, I mean, it was a simple network, uh, the longer it takes. But it's reasonably fast, so welcome everybody to lecture five. The other way to do it, you can say it now on the yeah, I don't know if it's a reflection of how I give the lecture, but at least it's, uh, I mean, it's forming halfway meaningful sentences. They have the length of sentences, there are commas, there is a full stop, and so on. What we also, what Sebastian also did right now is a character-based model. I mean, you could just switch between the two, right, once you have the code. It's very easy, especially because we gave you the tokenizers, the thing that breaks the text into tokens, whether you go word by word or character by character. So what's the context here, 64? Okay, 64, yeah, so welcome. Uh, I think I should type a bit more here. Welcome everybody to uh, lecture seven on data Let's just see how it continues from here. So now it just takes the last 64 or it, it pads them with something if it's not enough and then goes character by character and let's just see. That's what you in uh, so So what you see here, so now it has, now it really goes character by character and it's interesting that it at least forms correct words, mostly, right? But I mean, yeah, that's what you something in a let melding, so the simple on the... So now the sentences don't make too much sense, but at least it gets words right, it gets apostrophes, it, it does a space, so... Of course you're all now used to uh, chat GPT and stuff like this, and you say, ah, oh, that's not so great, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a language model with just a few parameters, you learned it for the exercise sheet, and it already does something meaningful. So it's actually quite amazing. I mean, one gets spoiled very quickly when you have these. I mean, uh, OpenAI trained this model. It has like, I don't know, uh, a trillion parameters. Nobody knows still, I think, how many parameters GPT-4 has and was trained with using, I don't know how many GPUs, cost $100 million. Here's another one, Sparkle. Oh, and let me first show you the... Uh, just trained on a lot of Sparkle queries from some log. So just Sparkle queries. So now you could just give it Sparkle queries. And now again, character-based. Here's a character-based model. What's the context length there, Sebastian? Do you know? 64. Okay, 64. But let's, uh, yeah, let's just type something, select question mark. You remember Sparkle? We did it in lecture five or something like this. Okay, just takes the last character, 64, and then predicts the next one. I mean, yeah, we could try, I mean, it's interesting, right? It gets the syntax right, it gets a variable, then a space, the where is correct, the opening uh, parenthesis, the closing parenthesis, then it forms these things correctly, and I mean, it's a, it's a Sparkle query that looks all right. So I think it's quite amazing that with a very simple language model. And of course, now you give it more parameters, maybe a different architecture, you train it longer, and you already get stuff that's pretty amazing. Okay, so that was the last sheet. Those who did it, I think, learned a lot. Here's the course evaluation. So first part of the uh, main part of the lecture, so we had these two lectures this year, I think uh, you realized that. So I'm comparing on several slides with the last winter semester, which was only information retrieval. So for once, this was uh, two and one, and you could decide. 
So registered for the exam, latest numbers, 118 for databases and information systems and 89 for information retrieval. Last semester for information retrieval, 80. So that's over 200 people registered for the exam. So in the evaluation, so this time sheets were voluntary. In the past, sheets were mandatory and you received some points if you participated in the evaluation. And then usually 90% of people participated. This is what happens when it's voluntary. So how many? That's 70 of 200. So that's like one third of the people participate. But it's not bad. One third is the representative feedback. So computer science, most computer science, we don't have any people from math this semester. Not sure why. Embedded systems engineering, but it's really mostly computer science. So nominations for teaching award, also a fair number. Thank you very much. So that's uh, 48. And in the following, I will give, as usual, a summary of your feedback. And as also usual, it's all linked on the wiki. So if you go here, results of the official evaluation, if you click on this, you get a page which in the beginning has the basic course information. So it, about the evaluation, mail sent on. Yeah, it's just for documentation purposes. Also interesting for us, also says that the exercise sheet were uh, voluntary this year. You even have the full reports linked here for databases and information system. That's how the result looks like, what we get from the evaluation and the one for information retrieval. So it's two separate courses and two separate evaluations. Here you also see 39 gave feedback here, 35 here. You see the answers to all the questions, the grade distributions. You can look at that if you want. We also copied all the free text comments here. So what you wrote, if you want to read it, it's always very interesting. Criticism, uh, everything, praise. I will summarize, discuss a few things. <coughs> so. And you can read the details if you want. Style of the course. And there are some interesting observations, as usual. And a few things I have to say. I don't know yet what I will say. Also language model. We are all language models. Danke, Frank. So learned a lot. 62% learned a lot. So in the last, OK, here we have, uh, let me just add that missing uh, three here. Not sure. Yeah, 60%. So, which means 38% didn't, don't fully agree. I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of this, but yeah, it's. Um, I also blame it on social media. So, 14% uh, neither fully nor agree that they learned a lot. Yeah, okay, but maybe it's just a reflection of if you didn't go to the lecture and didn't do anything, you didn't learn a lot. Okay, that's uh, explained well, about 80%. That's, I think, a statistical variance of compared to last year, level of contents. Yeah, so not so many. That, that's a good number between appropriate and high. If everybody says it's appropriate or easy, then it's too easy. That's just how people answer in these questions. So nothing. Uh, exercises, so 57% found them very good. 30, 10% now that neither found them good or very good. Okay. Quality overall, 67%. So that's also much less than uh, last year. 26% good. And <coughs> this year we had a new question. Uh, for a reason, and let me try to, <coughs> and the question was, did you participate in the exercise sheets? And uh, you could say, yes, I did all of them, most of them, so-so, a few of them, none of them. And let me see if this works. This is now <coughs> a sparkle engine on the evaluation data, and uh, let me see whether this works. <coughs> I don't know if you remember uh, Sparkle, so let me just uh, see. Okay, let me take a course by me. Let me <coughs> 
let's take databases and information system first. Let's take this winter semester. I only gave it this winter semester for the first time. Let's look at... <coughs> there should be Gesamtbewertung. Okay, there's a grade for Gesamtbewertung. You get so one, two or three was given. And now let's also... So one triple here is one uh, one feedback from you. So we don't know who gave it, but we know so one one row from the feedback table. And now lo let's look at let's see the auto completion is really useful here. Freiwillige Übung. <coughs> so one was I did everything. Five was uh, yeah. So let me call it exercises here. Did exercises. And now let's do the following. Let's uh, group by did exercises. So for each, for one, two, three, four, five, I want to group this. And what do I want? <coughs> for each group, I want the average grade. Maybe I should call it grade. This lecture is in English and not note. So that's like the overall. If you should give one grade to the whole lecture, and I'm curious what will come out here. And isn't it interesting that you can do this with a... So that's the average grade per group of how much did you... And also let's look at how many people were in that group. And let's, uh, let's sort it by first... Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay, I think if I call it Note, then I get some nicer... Oh, I don't have to call it... I think it's just... Uh, yeah. <coughs> so, okay, interesting. So those who did all of the exercises gave the course a 1.14 on average. Those who... Okay, only two. That's also interesting. So those who participated in the ev evaluation mostly did the exercises. So the others just didn't participate. This is also interesting. You, s you also see this here, right? So uh, seven people who participated did all of the exercises, most of the exercises, half, half, some of them and uh, none of them. I mean, this last row is probably not statistically significant. It's only two people. Those people who did just a few exercises gave an average grade of 1.71. Those people who did all of the exercises did gave an average grade of 1.14 to them. I think that's super interesting. I think that's super interesting and it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, a phenomenon which we also see in the society. I mean, you do, yeah, people, you participate, you don't participate, still you have an opinion. And uh, it's super interesting. I don't say more about this now, maybe later. Let's just continue with the next slides. Actually, I, I didn't look at these numbers before. We could now look at other courses. Actually, how is it for... Of course, you always have to wonder about statistical... Okay, I think this lecture is called Suchmaschinen. How does it look there? Okay, there it's not so clear. Interesting. For information retrieval, it's not so clear. Let's take another course from the, I don't know. What other courses do we have? Einführung, Einführung die Programmierung. Okay, that was also this semester. Okay. <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. But also here, I would say you see a clear trend. Okay, one more thing I should say. You may say, okay, the difference from I did all the exercises two and I did none of the exercises six. Oh, there was six. <laughs> oh, I think six is not applicable, which means I <laughs> didn't get it. Okay, but the difference from here to here, that's half a grade and you could say half a grade is not that much. I think there's one very important thing to 
understand when you read studies, also studies about life science, medicines, when you take this medication, when you exercise each morning, how much does it prolong your life or something like this. You never get these huge numbers, right? Usually it says if you drink uh, alcohol or something, you die 1.3 years earlier. The problem is when you do such studies and also such statistics with many people, there are so many confounding factors, right? So many other reasons which influence this, which means when you get a significant effect like this one here, from 2 to 2.5, that usually means it's a huge effect, right? So if, you, if, if in a study with 100,000 people you get that uh, by drinking alcohol you die two years earlier, then in reality it, it's probably a much bigger effect. If you see an effect at all, but uh, because of study is a mix of so many people and so many confounding pa uh, factors, the average thing, the difference usually is smaller. <coughs> so now let's continue. I think these results are super interesting. And, and we will do this over the year and then the, we will get more statistical significance. Effort relative to ECTS, yeah, it wasn't a lot of effort for those who didn't <laughs> do the exercises. So those numbers are smaller. This means it was a very high effort. That's what, how it was last year, department average. So last semester the exercise sheets were mandatory. <coughs> Let me just say, as usual, we, and we mean Sebastian, <coughs> did do a lot of work to do the boring stuff for you, right? For example, we provided all the tokenizers for you for the last exercise sheet so th that you could, and also we prepared the data sets for you. So if you do real research on this thing, usually it already starts with the data. It's dirty, you have to clean it, you have to fix it in many places. Before you can even start, we gave you super nice data sets and it's a lot of work to pro provide nice data sets and all this so you could directly go and focus on the interesting stuff. I personally also like the boring part, I should mention that. It's uh, this monotonic, it suits my personality, but uh, some don't. So uh, boring, monotone stuff, I love it. So materials and service. Yeah, 66% of you found the materials very good. I mean, the department average is uh, abysmal, but 66%. So 30% found them only good. I'm not sure. I mean, there's in the materials. Yeah, I, I don't know what to. It's, it's just, I guess, how people respond in such a service. You say, ah, could be better. I, again, I blame it on social media. So, service, same thing, 68%, 28%. Okay, I mean, again, compared to the department average, it's great, but yeah. And then, then again, if, you, if the numbers are too high, you probably live in a dictatorship. So, <laughs> how did you follow the lecture? So, these are typical numbers. So, 28% mainly by attending live. That's now the people who participated in the evaluation. And we know those people mostly did the exercises, at least some of them. So most of the people we just don't know about. That. But they will show up in the exam and we have more interesting statistics because we will see how well they do in the exam. I'm really yeah, looking forward to this. So Frank went away. He did all the technical support here, which so far, this is the last lecture. Let's see how it goes today, went really well. It's quite a lot of uh, work we do here so that everything goes so smoothly with Zoom and everything and uh, recordings. Alexander Monaret's doing that for a number of years now, doing a great job, the recordings. People in the past commented on the recordings. Nowadays it's just normal that you have great recordings, but that's okay. Tutors and assistants. So the tutors were a mix of postdocs, PhD students, and also some experienced master students. Those were their names. Th for those of you who did the exercise sheet, you should recognize some of them. They, they also got feedback. It was very positive. You negotiated the feedback you wanted, and yeah, I didn't see any negative feedback there. <coughs> and I believe uh, in individual feedback. That's why we do it like this and not tutorials. You have someone you can ask, you can ask questions, they can help you. 
Actually, one thing, we had these individual slots, we didn't talk about them anymore, right? Nobody used them. Okay, there's so much I could say here, let me briefly mention it. Actually, nobody this time said, I want a tutorial, that's interesting. Because usually people always say, I want a tutorial, and then, but then they don't go to it. And if they go to it, they don't really pay attention. But anyway, <coughs> What we did, what we are doing for a number of years now is offer, like you can make an appointment with your tutor and just say, okay, I need help, the forum doesn't do it for me, can we talk and you explain me something. So we had this tool, I announced it in the first lectures and I think it was used only very rarely. So I guess for, for the others the forum just worked and yeah, many just didn't do the exercises. So a big thank you to the tutors. And please, if you like that, uh, you like the feedback, you also think individual feedback is important, consider to give back and become a tutor yourself in the future. So coming up is programming in C++. In the next summer semester, if you like programming, even C++ or just programming at all, you want to become a tutor in our group. I think it's very nice work. Uh, <coughs> just write, write me an email. And then there's Sebastian, who's sitting here. Sebastian did a great job. So he did uh, a lot of all the work behind the scene, unthinkable without him. He helped me a lot, in particular with the last part, where he's super expert, all the learning stuff. He knows uh, more than me, because that's uh, what he works on. All the great sheets, the code templates, the data sets, and, and everything that was uh, Sebastian. So uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. It was a pleasure. Yeah. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, it was really, a really great, great help. And I hope you also liked it <laughs> a bit, yeah. OK, so. Praise, yes, uh, I mean, uh, it's long feedback, read it yourself if you're interested. Even though only 30% participated in the, f uh, still you get a lot of comments because it's over 200 people. Just a quick summary, I think this is a bit random here and not complete. Interesting, understandable lectures, well organized, interactive. Topics are exciting, a lot of effort put into the course, yes, that's correct, live coding. People love live coding. <coughs> By the way, that's interesting. Live coding, I, I love it too. I've been doing that for a long time. Now there are YouTube channels of people doing live coding. This didn't exist 10 years ago. I mean, we did it 10 years ago. And there are actually a few channels where people just live code stuff, like, like let's do, uh, I don't know, let's program a language model. Some of them like have a million, millions of views. So people like that. And, and I always thought that it's a great, I, I, yeah, I also like to watch it sometimes. Great exercise sheets, combination of theory and practice, sometimes humorous, mm -hmm. student feedback taken. <coughs> yeah, I think I had more comedy elements in the past, but yeah, I, I don't think it's the main purpose. Student feedback taken seriously, very imp and, and more stuff. So a lot of praise, some criticism, there was some good criticism and some weird criticism, as usual. Uh, I, I think I have one example of a weird one, but the other ones are uh, meaningful. And I will, uh, of course, we always take in the feedback, use it to uh, improve it. And let me just comment on some. Lectures had theory, so there was theory. And a typical example, <coughs> and I take it up when I do one of the when we go through possible exam questions, I think was the lecture about fuzzy search. <coughs> and so there was the edit distance. I don't know if you remember, it was a long time ago. It was in December last year. And then there was all this uh, three gram thing. So here we have the three grams of Freiburg. And now you look at two words and how many three grams they have in common. So you look at what's the difference in the number of three grams, which three grams are only in this word, not in the other. And then we had this uh, uh, powerful uh, theorem or corollary of our lemma that if you 
If you have a small edit distance, if two words are similar, they have a lot of three grams in common. And not just qualitatively, qualitatively but a real number, right? So free burger and pre-urger have, they are similar and they have <coughs> At least they have actually six uh, three grams in common and at least five per hour lower bound, which we proved. <coughs> and you could use this for more efficient fuzzy search because computing the edit distance is expensive. And just by looking at the three grams in common, when you don't have a lot of three grams in common or Q grams, whatever you use, you can say, okay, these are not, not similar enough. I don't even have to compute the edit distance. And then the sheet was implementing this and later you integrated it into your web app, but there was also this math part behind it, right? And so, and we had this year no exercise sheet which practiced now or questions that go beyond this math path or somehow practice it. So for example, proving this theorem or something. So that was something several of you said and I understand that. <coughs> because the exercise sheets were all practical, but I said, look, there are some, there will be questions about this in the exam. Did you understand this formula? Because it's one thing, of course, for the implementation, okay, now I need this formula. I just copied it from the slide, yeah. But did you also understand it? <coughs> and we had no exercises about this. I will come back to this on slide 15. Then a very frequent request for many years has been, this is such an interesting uh, topic, you should have two courses, and in the future there will be two courses. I have a slide about this. <coughs> so we finally did it, and this fused database and information systems and information retrieval was the intermediate step. The lectures were quite long. As a compensation, there were two completely free weeks. <coughs> We tried many different things in the past. I think this was by far the best solution so far. And many of you actually liked it. So you, could, you can always watch the recordings. If you have to go earlier, <coughs> there are these two free weeks as a compensation. And the nice thing is you don't have to rush. You can do one topic in a lecture. If it takes more time, it takes more time. And it's also nice to have a completely free week. I mean, the alternative is, I see, think some colleagues do it, you just have two lectures, even two full lectures per week. I don't think people like that, telling from the feedback for those courses who do it. Then you have two appointments, two times where you have to appear, listen for one hour. I think it's much better like this. <coughs> I'm sorry. Exercise sheets should be obligatory again. None of my friends did them and I missed the interaction. That's interesting. I think most people like the voluntary sheet, but there's also a downside. This was a downside. I mean, the obvious thing is that there are, I think, many people who would benefit from doing it. And if you don't force them, is there anything funny with the slides or just locally funny or? The reason for? for the yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting reason. You had a question? Or? <laughs> okay, to whoever wrote this, that's the advice you get from the, uh, from the cr wisdom of the crowd, get new friends. I think it's a good comment. That's not what I count as a weird comment. It's something, I mean, the the thing we discussed about is there are many people, they would benefit from the exercises, they just don't get the, they don't have the drive or the motivation to do them. If you force them, they do it, it's good for them. And so, yeah, but you are all grown up, so we, we didn't do that this time. But this, okay, yeah, if only few people do it, but yeah, here you have the advice, <laughs> get new friends, I think. Interesting advice. Okay. There were some weird comments about the DB contents in this course in comparison to the previous course, which I, 
I, I don't agree, so for several reasons. First, there was a comment which listed all kinds of stuff you should have done in this course. I mean, first, this course, and in the future, it will be the databases and information systems course. It's not called databases, it's called databases and information systems, and it always has been for decades. And information systems these days are not only databases. Yeah? The information systems of our times are search engines, language models, databases. So, and the lecture in the past was just a hardcore database lecture. And not even hardcore, it was basically just doing SQL. I think it was a bit old-fashioned, very old-fashioned, in fact. And things like query optimization were not even in that lecture. So in the few lectures we did, we did basic database stuff, we did SQL, we even did query optimization, efficiency aspects, and so on. So I think these comments, uh, uh, you can read them, I don't agree with them, but there are always some comments like this. That's also okay. Uh, in the future, there will be two courses. This has been a request for many years now. Of course, it's a lot more work for us to have two full courses. Here is a preliminary curriculum of the courses, so there will be the basic course, which will be more like the original information retrieval lecture, but with database basics in them, without the learning stuff. So if you have any feedback of what I will talk about now in the next two minutes, let us know in the forum or send me a mail or whatever. I think it's a good idea. Let me back up one sentence. What, it, what we did in this lecture, and we also did that in the past, we have a part about like classical stuff, algorithms and data structures, and all kinds of search techniques, and then the learning stuff. That's what we did in the last three lectures. Also in the past, for the information retrieval lecture, we had one half about more classical things, and then one half about learning stuff, so the vector view of things. Now that we will have two courses, I think it makes sense to just separate this. So you have no, because really it's switching gears, right? You notice that for the last three lectures, it's a completely different world when everything is vectors. Now it's vectors, now you do stuff with vectors, learning-based method. It's just a different world, a different way of thinking. So the basic course will have no vectors and will end with the web application stuff and a lot of the good stuff which we couldn't do this semester, also like efficiency stuff, entropy, compression, super exciting, also some nice theory stuff in here. That would be the basic course. And then the advanced course would just do everything based on linear algebra, which, because it's just also huge. Starting with the vector space model and embeddings, like we did three lectures ago, and then culminating in language models and just going in more detail and, and more time to really understand it. That's my suggestion. We discussed it a little bit. It's not uh, fixed now. And how will this go? Well, this will be, each of these will be repeated every two years. This has to be given every year, so in the other years, somebody else will give it. And the candidate right now is Joschka Bödeka. He said he would be willing to do this in the future. So I will give this again in uh, two years. And this one, now you would expect that I would give it next year, but uh, there's a reason why I'm on sabbatical next year probably. So it will take, I'm sorry, uh, two and a half more years. So you will have to wait for that unless unforeseen things happen. So if you want to give feedback now or in the future, whether you like this setup or you think something, sh yeah, you have a lot of time to give feedback, but yeah. But the general thing, I also think it's a good idea, two courses now on this very exciting overall topic. Here's some specific improvements we planned based on your feedback and our experience. So certainly are you completely right, the exercises should be a mix of theory and practice. There was just no room for that because there was so much new content and yeah, and, and also basic stuff where it's just good to get the hands-on experience. So, so sorry for that, but I will say something about the examiner. I agree, it should be a mix of theory and practice. Keep the longer lecture time with a great break in between and one or two weeks off, I think. Uh, but now that we have two lectures, we can spread the materials over more lectures, so less overtime. 
I think this will help. <coughs> Exercise sheets, let me know your opinions now or uh, in the future, send me an email, write in the forum. I think it's a really hard question, should you make it? I mean, there are arguments for both sides. Uh, the one is, I, I already said it earlier, if you make it voluntary, all the people who would certainly, who benefit the most from doing it, don't do it. That's just how it is. The people who are already like it, they are motivated and everything, they do it even if it's voluntary. I was shocked how few people submit. I mean, over 200 and it's like 10% who, who do the exercises. Honestly, I understand if you don't come to the lecture, if you like to watch videos or just look at the slides. I also did that when I studied. Not doing the exercises just doesn't make sense. Whoever listens, who, I mean, <laughs> it makes sense if you just do the exercises and nothing else. But just watching and not doing the exercises, it's, uh, it just doesn't make sense. You have to, if you want to learn something, the exercises with everything are the, uh, it's, yeah, just this one thing, I think I say that frequently, there are a lot of great math channels out there. If you don't have, haven't made this experience, and, and great ones like uh, uh, three brown, one blue, or the other way around, uh, Grant Sanderson, I think this guy, he makes great math videos, and there are lots of other math channels. Watch one of these videos, they're fantastic, the animation, the work that goes into them. I watched many of them, you don't remember a thing when you watch these videos. And Grant Sanderson does the greatest math videos of all times. It's so great, he explains great, he has a great voice, puts a lot of work into it. You watch the video, you understand everything, so nice, so intuitive. One week later, you don't remember anything because you have just watched it. That's just how the brain works. Just by watching it, you really, you don't remember a thing. You just remember the topic. If you watch it again, ah. So you have, that's the only way you learn is, is by doing it. That's, uh, I'm sorry, but that's how we are wired. Okay, any uh, questions or comments on this part before I go to the exam part? And then please feel free to give more feedback later. So the date is fixed, not by us, March 18th, Monday. There are some species, uh, so for most of you that's just mandatory and fixed, also for us, mandatory and fixed. Few people like Erasmus students who have to leave earlier can make, uh, get special conditions. I think there are one or two. If I haven't replied yet, sorry, I will. We can make individual appointments. Please be there 15 minutes earlier. We don't, haven't fixed the duration yet, two hours or 2.5 hours. So it will be basically all the rooms here. If really 200 people come, which is a lot, that's more than for algorithms and data structures. I'm surprised exactly in which room you will be. That will be announced in time on the forum. Bring this stuff, bring uh, colors. Colors is always nice. Don't bring red, that's our color. Okay, that's just uh, formal stuff. What else you can bring? Let me announce this early so that you know we're doing this for we used to do open book exams where you can just bring everything. People like that, but actually I think people don't understand that if you do an open book exam, it has to be harder. If you do an open book exam, you can't ask a simple question, which you can just look up on the slides, right? You have to ask harder questions. Where you have to think even if you have all the material. That's why we don't do that anymore. But you can bring one page, just like stuff, oh, there's this formula, I always forget it. You can write it on a page as small as you want. Yeah, you can use four point, you can use micro fish, uh, but only if your eye can, uh, yeah, it's these things. Uh, you, you are not allowed to bring devices for reading this. So you can one page on two sides. The nice thing is if you have one page, and very important, the rule is you have to write it yourself. You can't use, not somebody of you just prints all the lectures in microfish in one point font on two sides and distributes to everyone, that's not allowed. You have to write it yourself and I like this very much because the great thing about it, if you write one page yourself 
then you don't need it anymore because just by writing it, it will be in your brain. Experience just shows that. So actually by just preparing that page, you do important work. But I think it's a very nice psychological help. You say, oh, I'm always unsure about that part. So one page you can just bring. I, I think it's, it's a great rule. So that you can bring nothing else. Of course, no electronic devices or anything or communicating with others. There will be a sub-forum for questions about the exam. So, uh, of course, in the semester break, we usually reply very uh, fast, but in the break, maybe a little bit slower. And there's a tendency to ask all your questions <laughs> in the night before the exam. You might not get the answer in time. And maybe it's also too late to, <laughs> to ask questions <laughs> three hours before the exam. So don't do it. Start preparing early. And if you didn't do the exercises, do them now. So types of questions. As usual, there are three types of questions. If you think of the lectures, they often started very simply, like with a simple example. And then we did, we progressively went deeper to really understand it. And there will be questions like this. And now in the following, I will also have three example questions, like basic stuff. Then there will be coding, and there will be more coding this time, because we had a lot of coding in the exercises. Not 500 lines of code, of course, in the exam, and you don't have a machine, you will write it on paper. So small functions, 10, 15 lines max, but that will be, and you can look at past exams. And deeper understanding, of course, nothing very deep, but did you really, did you just learn it by heart or did you understand, right? I mean, it's one thing, you will see an example in the following. Of course, you should know this formula. It's the central formula of the lecture on of fuzzy search, right? The number of Qgrams in common somehow depends on uh, the added distance. Yeah, let me just say that again. If you have two words, they are very similar. They have a lot of Qgrams in common. And this is the formula, a formula, how it's related. So knowing the formula is one thing. You should understand what it means and at least how in principle it's derived. And there will be some questions which check that you didn't just learn it by heart, you understood it. Again, this won't, there will be no very hard questions here, just checking did you just learn it schematically or did you understand it. So there are always these three types of questions. Given this criticism, which was justified that there are very many practical, only practical exercises this year, I said very often in the lecture, look, like I just said again, this is a kind of thing which might be on the exam, like small uh, math things. There will be more practical tasks. So we promise that. So there will be more type two questions than usual so that those who did the exercises uh, will also have a benefit. So if you did the exercises, you should get a clear advantage. So it will pay off. Yeah, and here's the one slide about learning. I, I think it's useful to have. Uh, how, how should you learn? Some of you know this already, but I think for many, uh, you can't say it uh, often enough. Look at this slide, for example, just as one example. Let me just explain two ways of learning for you. One wrong, one right. And there's really no alternative. It's not that there are learning types. And one way is to look at the slide and say, OK, I see Q, Q, yes, greater, equal, I understand, proof, OK, for arbitrage. You go through the steps, like watching a great math video, and you say, yes, 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 I agree, I agree, yes, I understood it. It's like you watch a video, maybe you hold the video and you say, OK, I understood it. You watch, you follow the steps, and you nod your head, and you say, yes, 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 to every step. You learn not a thing that way. It's very important. The only way you learn is you watch the video or you look at the slide, maybe for some time only, and then you put it away and now you do it yourself on paper. It's the only way. There's n without exception, that's how you learn and only that way. You have to put it away. And here's another example to clarify this. So we are for you 
all the exams here from previous semesters. Now they contain stuff which we didn't do this semester. You can ignore those tasks, but let's just go here. And there are two versions. There's just the exam, so you don't need to go to the Fachschaft. has a great database of exams. You don't need to go there. We just give them to you. All the exams from previous year. Here's the exam questions. But there's also, for your convenience, exams with solutions. Very dangerous, right? So this is a version of the exam with solution sketches. Do not distribute. Don't use it when you do old exams for training. It's the worst way to learn. Use it only for checking your solutions after. Look, one way, and I'm sure some of you will do it anyway, you look at this exam and you say, let me look at the task and then at the, ah, yes, 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 I would also have done it like this. I understand. You look at the task, you look at the solution, you look, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I know that many people do that. It's just like looking at the lecture proof, watching the video. Yes, yes, yes. You don't learn a thing. It doesn't work. So that's why it's written here in bold and red and on the slides. It's, but yeah. So it's the only way you have to listen to it, put it away, then do it yourself in your own words. Going back to this uh, here, uh, sorry, now it's, I have to go to that. And, and if you, that's one more point I want to make, right? There's oh, more than, let's say, back to this one here. I mean, maybe you do the proof a little bit differently. I mean, there's not just one way to prove it, like there's not just one way to implement a program, right? Maybe you do it a little bit differently. That's fine. Do it in your own words. Afterwards, you can check. Usually, you don't even need to check, right? If you really understood something, then just by doing it, it's the check. You see whether you understood it, right? And then it's really just a formal thing to check, okay, is the number really correct? But you don't actually, you don't even need the solutions. You, you will feel that yourself. So that's on this. Yeah, I said that, it's just written on the slide again. And uh, you can do a similar thing for coding, by the way, right? Coding until the tests work. You also don't understand. Uh, that's also dangerous with coding by unit test. Just write code until the tests go through. Okay, so there, all the exams are on the wiki, and that's a great way, of course, to, to learn also if you just do old exam questions, very many of them. As I said, not all of them apply to this year, but still there are many of them. Okay, let's do a few, shall we? And then we have a break, and then the for the coding part, here's a question in the chat. Can it happen that this can also contain something with PyTorch? Yes, of course. Or just common coding. Okay, there's PyTorch and common coding. It's a good question. The thing is, you don't have a compiler in the exam. So you will make more syntax mistakes. I will write a uh, program in a second. I will make small mistakes. You don't get point subtraction for that, right? You don't know what's the name of that function that computes the length of a string in Python. You write length. I think it's called len in, in Python, right? You don't get subtraction for that. I if you are not sure, you can ask or you can just write, I'm using the function that computes the length. I think it's called that way. That's fine. But if you write code, which looks like you have never written a line of Python code in your life before, and people do that, just like random stuff, pseudo code, weird stuff, you get point subtraction. And even in Torch, you know in Torch there's a function which gives you, like you have a matrix with 1,000 columns and you want columns 3, 5, 7. Invent your own syntax, it doesn't matter. You know that this function it's called, I don't even know now what it's called, indices or what is it called, Sebastian? If you want, select? Index. index select, yeah. See, I don't know it. It doesn't matter, right? You know that it exists and, and you just give it a name. You don't get point subtraction for that. So that's not the point that you learn the Python manual. But if you did the exercises, you know what functions exist and how you do things in principle. So I think that's very fair. So here's the task, and let me see whether I will pass or fail. 
And I didn't try the pen before. Oh my. So, stress, stress. So this is a matrix. You are given a term document matrix with five documents. That's a document. The terms don't matter. And now you had some simple questions about uh, ranking and evaluation. And now you have to find a vector such that if you compute uh, dot product scores, you get a particular ranking. So I want a vector such that when I multiply them, just compute the scores, then I get then document number one gets the highest score, then document number three, which is this one, then four, two, five. This is abbreviation of the real task. You can see it. It's linked on the wiki. It also says that if two documents get the same score, rank the one with the smaller number. So if D2 and D4 get the same score, rank D2 first. So the questions are usually formulated that way that they are. So, so let's try to uh, solve that. Let's see whether I will be successful. So here's my Q. Let me see. I want... So document one and three should come first, and they have, so let's maybe put, so two should come. So maybe I should put a weight here, right, on, on these two, one and four, and here I have two and zero. So let me just give some weight so that these thing here <coughs> are high. And D1 should become before D3, so let me maybe give, uh, let me just put a 2 here and a 1 here, and let me just try that, so it's a bit trial and error here. If I do that, I get 2 plus 4, it's 6, so I get a high score for D1, and I want D1 first. I get, uh, yeah, let me just uh, do the math here. So now if I do that, I would get a score of 6. It would be the first. I would get a score of 2 here. That's now okay. Of four. Oh, 4. Yeah, yeah, I wanted 4. That's why I picked the... Uh, thank you. <sighs> Nervous. It's an exam. So, and now let's do the other one. So 2, 1, that's Three, that's look good. This should be first. Their number is correct. Let me do this here, two, four, and let me do this one. And I'm leaving that open in case I want to correct something. Now I get three. So what would be the order now? Now it would be D1, D3, just compare it with here, D1, D3, D4, D2, D5. It's already the correct order. Okay, I was lucky. So I can just try the zero here. I don't even need that. Okay, so that's a little bit of, you have to play around a little bit. So with that, you get the right order. Okay, that's the first part. Now let's, uh, which docs should be relevant such that P at R is 0 0.5? Okay, let's, uh, so P at R is 0 0.5. So first you should, of course, you have to know, <laughs> you have to know what compute the dot product and stuff. Now you have to know what P at R is. P at R is P at number of relevant documents. So if I, so this says, if I look at the first four, it should be one over four, which means the first four in this list, there should be one relevant one. And then P at R should be 0 0.5. That looks like among the first two, there should be one relevant one, right? So it looks like this already tells me I think how I should do it. Probably I should, among the first two, those should not be relevant and this one should be relevant. So now I already have that, right? So precision at uh, 2 is now 0 0.5, precision at 4 is 0 0.25 and for R to be 2 I need another relevant one. So I think this should also be relevant. I hope that's correct. Yes, so now I have uh, P at, t yeah, let's just write that down. P at R is now uh, P at 2 and that's 0 0.5. Check. And then I have P at 4. 
So it's a little twist, it's not just writing down the definitions, it's doing it by an example, it's checking whether you, you understood it, so that's uh, 0 0.25, it's 1 over 4. And let me maybe not write the, let me, I mean that's 1 over 2 and 1 over 4. Let me write it that way. And that's also correct. And now uh, compute the average precision now, that's just knowing whether you know the average precision. So average precision is you have two relevant documents, so that's precision at R1, uh, that the rank of the first document plus precision at the rank of the second relevant document divided by two. And the first one is at, yeah, that's precision at two plus precision at five divided by two Precision at 2 is uh, 0 0.5. Precision at 5 is what? what? 0 0.4, yeah, it's uh, 2 out of 5, right? That's 0 0.4. You also see you don't need a calculator divided by 2, and that's 45%. Uh, okay, so that's like one exercise. I wouldn't say, so that's like somewhere between easy and it's, it's medium, I would say, right? You don't really have to, yeah, you need to focus. This is a focusing thing. You need to understand the definitions, but then, I mean, you have to remain reasonably calm. That's always an issue in exams. I understand that. But if you know the definitions, that's, you can do it. There's no doubt about it. So there's really no deep thought or anything. It's also not deep understanding required. Okay, here's another one that's also not untypical. Okay, let me see whether I can do this. That's also, there will always be a question about web. So if you didn't do the web app exercise because you think web apps are, nobody needs web apps or they don't belong in this lecture, that's bad because there will be a question in the exam. So write an HTML page with, head, and it's actually simple if you did it. So let me write an HTML page. Let me try to do this. And this is proof that you can write code <laughs> on paper or on slides. You can just do it, see? So uh, a heading, so I have to know. And again, there are always some people who write stuff which looks like they've never written anything like that before. I, I mean, yeah. So uh, with heading, enter query. Okay, let me write that. Enter query. So that's really, I mean, if you know this stuff, you just have to write it. An input field, so you have to know input. Take some time now. Now I, hmm, I'm not even sure. Type equals text probably. Yeah. And then uh, I think it should have an ID. And that's, I think, my uh, query. And then I'm done. I need this. So what else do I need? The paragraph, okay. Paragraph is like this. It should also get an ID. Any questions? Okay, I will I look at the question in a second. ID is, here I will write my result. And that's just the end of the paragraph then. And then I have a button. Actually, I'm not quite sure how to write. I think it's type submit. Hmm. Now I'm actually not sure how to, I think, let me try to hmm, compute. Is that correct? I'm not even sure whether that's the right way to do it. Oh, and I'm lacking space for my JavaScript, which I need to write in a second. Okay, so here I'm not sure whether it's the completely right syntax, and I'm not, sh not sure, do I get full points for this? Hmm. Okay, now with IDs, and now I should include some JavaScript, so I need to include the script tag here, script, source, equal. So it's basically just, 
it's also calming. You just write down what you know and it calms you down, right? It's just, it's like language model, but a simple uh, alphabet, like, okay, source, and let me just call it script.js. And then let me call it, yeah, slash script. Could also write type. Uh, and then I just close the, and I could, yeah, so it takes some time, but if you've done this before, it's it's very easy. And now I should include the JavaScript for when the user presses the button, sends the content to a server using a GET request and the URL of your choice. Let's also do that. Okay, let me try that. Document, uh, how do you do it? Query selector? I'm not sure whether I will write the full code now. Maybe it takes too long. So if I press on the button, oh, and I forgot. Now I will do what you also do when you write exams, that you find out that you forgot something. Now you have to, that's the problem. It's not an editor, it's written on paper. Now you have to squeeze something in here. And then it looks like this on the exam. So that's like a button but that's okay. So you will always have these arrows and insert this here and stuff, so it's actually good that uh, it's okay. So maybe you have the time to write it again, but yeah. So query selector, uh, now you have to know that if you reference an ID, you write it like this. Button. Now how do you say, I think it's on click. Now if you write click here, if you write button here without the hash, I think that's not knowing something, right? That IDs you do with the hash. If you write click and not on click, I think that's okay. On click, that's now a async function. I think you should know that. Async function. I think I don't need any parameters. I'm just clicking the button. So now I'm defining an uh, asynchronous function. So the first thing the function should do is get the query from the input field and I don't think I will do the complete exercise. So now I'm document. So there's a lot of boilerplate which you just have to write down but there are also a few things you have to understand. I mean how to do this in principle that there's document selectors where you can uh, get elements from the, so what do I want now? I want the thing with ID query. I think it's hard if you have never done this before. And now I need to send, and I think I will skip this in the interest of time. I mean, you can try that yourself. Now I have to send this to the server and and you also see, let me mention that there's also a, a time thing so if you've done this before, you can basically just write that down and it takes time. Yes, it takes time, but uh, if, you have, if you have never done this before and you have to think a lot, then it's, uh, you will have uh, time issues. So, so practice uh, pace here if you've done it before. And we will pay attention to yeah, stuff being not too time consuming to write down and everything. There's uh, Let's have a short break now, then I will do the third task and then the last part. So five minute break and please come back. Okay. On to the last task. Okay, one more task. That's a theoretical one. And then last half is last half hour is demos. Oh my, let me see what I can do that. Calculate the minimal possible, that's related to what I just showed edit distance between two strings of length five that have three three grams in common when using padding on both sides. And let me also tell you a little bit what I'm thinking when I'm doing. So I think I have not fully understand the task now. Let me just tell you how I solve those tasks like a language model. We are all language models, in case you didn't know. So I have two strings of length five. Let me just write that down. So I have x and y, and uh, the length is five. That's a good way to start. 
Okay, now I have padding on both sides, so, and it's about three grams, so let me just, I have uh, X with two dollars on both sides, and I have Y prime with a dollar on, let me just write down what I know, and this doesn't cost me anything, and I can also, by the way, how long are they? I added f four things, so they, I don't know if I need that. Their size is now... So that's not the letter X, it's the word X, right? So I have... The strings are not specified. Possible added distance, three three grams in common, using padding on both sides. So clearly it's a question about how the number of three grams in common is related to the added distance. I think that's that much I understand. I'm not sure about the answer now. That much I understand. So there's this uh, corollary from the lecture. And you don't have to prove that here. So this like the main theorem from, and that is, uh, let me write that down. That's the number of Q grams of the padded version of xy intersect this one. I think we have seen this on the slide. This is number of q grams which uh, these two have in common. And actually it says in the exercise, I can already write that down, that this is three. It says here they have three three grams in common. And this I think says that this is at least max of, now I'm not sure, I have to make a mark, is it greater or equal or less equal, I'm not sure right now, the max of the number of uh, Q grams of X prime, comma, the num so it's the number of Q grams of the longer ones, but here they are of the same length. minus, and now it's Q times, it's three grams, so three times the added distance. That's the X uh, prime, Y prime. And let me, let me take you, let me just tell you what I think. I haven't fully understand the task, I've just written down some things, but I already know in my mind now, oh, that looks good, I, that looks good, because I know this is given, this here I can compute, number of three grams if I know the string. This is given, this I also know because it's the added distance of, uh, so I already know, okay, I know all the things, so I, I know everything how to solve it. I don't yet know how to solve it, but I have all the information to solve it. So it already calms me down because I, and it's a two-step thing, knowing that I have all the information to solve it and then solving it. So the added distance is uh, between two strings here. It's about that one, okay. And this one I think we also know, right? So what's the, and they are of course both the same. And you tell me what's the number of uh, three grams of the padded version with five and maybe you know it, but I mean one way to do it is to just write down an example even if you are, I mean, you don't get strings with 3,000 letters in there, so let me just write something, A, B, C, D, E, dollar, dollar. How much Q grams do I have here? Seven. seven. I agree, it's seven. I mean, there's a formula for this, but you can just, I mean, how would you count it? The first one goes until here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that's one way. Of course, now when you, yeah, it's, I think there's time for writing down an example, just to be sure, maybe you know the formula because you practice it. If you now start writing down all the Q-grams, I think you're wasting too much time, Irene. That's just a side thing here, if you now list all the, but better double check. So it's seven, I think it's seven, yes. So now we have uh, seven, seven here. So let's just write that down, what we have now. So now we have 
3 is greater than 7 minus 3 times added distance between x and y. So I haven't solved it yet, but I kind of gathered all the information that obviously is, uh, or I think is, is, yeah, I just, it's obvious that one should uh, do it. And now the question is, what's the minimal possible edit distance? So I know this has to be true. If the edit distance would be zero, and let me just write that down. So let me just, uh, if the edit distance would be zero, let me just see whether that makes sense, edit distance. Then I would have three greater equal to seven times three times zero. That's not true, right? The inequality is not. And I think it helps to understand what that means, right? Let's back up for a second. They have three three grams in common, which means not so many, right? They have seven three grams and they only have relatively uh, yeah, it can't be. If they would be the same, which is this case, they would have to be much more uh, Q grams in common. So they only have three in common. So with zero, this is uh, violated. Le let's try the next one. Let's, if the added distance is one, let me just do it that way. And I don't have to do it. Then they are very similar. Then they should also have more Q grams in common, right? Three grams in common. This is still violated. Seven minus three is four. Three is not, so it can't. It also can't be. They have. Uh, and I, I would say this is an example of like the hardest task. There are not too many of those, but there will be some of those. I mean, it's, it's not that it's really hard, but you have to do some thinking. It's not just writing down the formula. So is that possible at a distance of two? And yes, that's possible. Seven minus three times two, seven minus six, three greater than one, that's possible. And wh what's nice, so the answer is two. The answer is two. And now, and just to tell you again how I'm, uh, answer is two. I hope that's correct. And to tell you again how, how, how I'm thinking. So now I did that. Now let me verify whether it makes sense. Let me go back and see. So what did I say? The minimal. Does it make sense minimal? Why is it asking for the minimal and not maximal? Yes, it makes sense because if they are the same, it can't be. They would have more three grams in common. This is violated. This makes sense. If the added distance is one, then they have need to have at least four in common per this inequality. Uh, and uh, in the task it says, I think it mentions the inequality, so it also can't be if they have two. So it, the minimal makes sense. So make these uh, sanity checks, right? It's asking for minimal. I'm not just computing something here. I'm trying to make sense of it. So zero doesn't work, one doesn't work. Two is the first one that works. So that's, uh, it fits the minimal and the answer is two. And of course, if they have fewer Q grams in common, then they could be more dissimilar. Okay, that's another example of a task. <laughs> I don't, you already, hope you don't get already get nervous now. Of course, uh, and in three examples, as I say, I think that's the hardest kind of task you could get, and there are not too many of those, but there are some of those. There will be a, a forum for asking questions. I already said that. Any more questions about the exam at this point? I already answered some questions in the chat. You get 100 points, 50% you need to pass. So in case you ask a question on the chat, I answered them in the break. No, the exam will not be held on a PC. It's all on paper, like I did here. And uh, will it be limited to the lectures? Yes. There were some slides that we didn't have time to go through. I think you have to give be more specific what you mean there. I think most 
of the stuff on the slides we covered. Sometimes I go over the some skip some slides because we already did it while we coded or I said it before. I don't really think we skipped stuff completely. Any questions now? Yes, please. Um, <coughs> Oh yeah, this is not how it's written on the task. Let me. This is just because the slide would have been too full. Now that you asked, let me just show to you how it's written on the exam, and also just so that you see how. So this was the exam, and what did it say? Task two two. No, that's not the right exam, right? Is it? No, no, it is. Write down the intermediate steps for the calculation. So that's what it says here. It means, and I mean, it goes without saying, but when you have such a question and the answer is a simple number, sim a single number, and you write down two, it's not enough. It's never enough for an exam, uh, for, for a question. You should just write down the steps. Now it's debatable how many steps, but just the steps which you did anyway, you should write them down. So this is just short. And we try to be ex as explicit as possible here. And whenever you are in doubt, there are always people in the room you can ask, how is this, is this, you can even say, look, I did this, this enough. Of course, we won't give you the answer, but you can ask these questions if you are unsure. And just, I mean, it's surprisingly common, I still don't understand it, that people just write down the end product of their thoughts. Write down, I mean, it's not that anyone, <coughs> I also can't do it, can look at this and say, oh, it's two, and write that down. You have a thought process. If you have a thought process, write it down. <coughs> and then that will be enough. <coughs> Couldn't the equation have been solved further? <coughs> yes, that is completely correct. You don't need to do that 0, 1, 2. You can just do that directly and find out that it's 2. I did that deliberately just to... I would do it like this just to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly. And I know there are many things going on at the same time. When I'm doing this, I'm saying, okay, there are not so many possibilities, let me just try them out. If by looking at the equations here I would see, oh, I have to write down 500 lines here, I wouldn't do it. But just this way, you see, by doing these three lines, which don't cost me a lot of time, I can make a sanity check. Am I understanding this correctly? Why is it saying minimal here? So that's a, that's a subtle thing and an experienced thing where does it pay to spend time? For example, writing down that example, I would also do it. Yeah, Maybe I know the formula for the number of uh, Q grams of the padded version. Why not write down a string real quick and check it? That costs 30 seconds. It pays off. Writing down all the three grams, I wouldn't do it. That's not necessary. I don't have to write down. That costs too much time. Writing down an example, yes. So you're completely right. I don't need this. Just by looking at this, I can figure out it's two. This, for me, it's safer, gives me reassurance that I'm understanding it correctly. Well, that's always an interesting trait of do I invest time? And I always like this, invest a little time to be more sure. I hope that's a good answer. <coughs> yes, and uh, the, the other comment in the chat says that yes, you can just solve that equation. But see, when you solve that equation here, <coughs> Just to make my point, and this is like meta technique, we could just, if we solve it here, we get uh, ED of x comma y uh, greater or equal, and now it's 4 over 3. <coughs> and yes, now, now it's greater or equal. Now what does this greater or equal mean? Should be, if it's not, it's violated. It's should you round it up, you should you round it down. It's not 100% clear to me because equations always, what does it mean? Of course the right interpretation is okay, 
For this not to be violated, the added distance has to be, so it has to be at least this, so you have to round it up, so the answer is two. For me, that's safer, but of course, <coughs> if it's super clear to you, you could just do it like this and then spare yourself this. For the exam, do we need to know proofs and concepts which we skipped, but were mentioned on the slides with a link to last year's slide? Oh no, that you don't need to know. That's a fair question. And let me give one example. Where was one example? Do you remember one? I have to think a little bit. Yeah, I think here was an example. Yeah, absolutely not. So for example, here we had that these two definitions of a hyperplane are equivalent, and last year we did a proof. It's a not so easy proof. It's not part of what you have to know <laughs> that you go to this, and I mean, if I go here now, I would probably see the proof, yes. So it's not that we expect you to know this proof, just because So when I linked to here, said we did it last year, not this year, it's not part of the material. Yes, good question. Okay, any more questions? Okay, let's go to the last part, which I think is also interesting, so after this is done, after the exam is done, and you hopefully all uh, passed it, you maybe want to do your project at some point, your uh, master, bachelor or master project, bachelor or master thesis. We usually like to do this together. You want to work with us. Let me just briefly introduce how it works, how we work. So three pillars, I think, we s and, uh, should sound familiar when you have done this course. We solve practically relevant problems, and you will see a lot of topics in a second. And uh, we have really interesting data, so we love data. We have a lot of, you saw a lot of data sets in, in this course for a reason, because we work a lot with data, and it's, it's so nice, so interesting data sets. You will see more examples in a minute. We make software, so we solve problems, and we make software that is useful and actually used. So we have a lot of, I already showed something in the first lecture, I will show more today. So, uh, and of course, if, you, if you're not writing software just for your thesis, but for others to use it, you have to make an effort, right, to, to write good software so that it's still alive in six months, <laughs> not just for your one table in your thesis. Yeah, it worked, yeah, you still want to be able to understand it, run it, extend it in half a year, should be well documented, it should have a nice user interface if you want something. Even yourself, you want to use it, should be easy, easy to use. And we also use theory, I just gave an example, this is a great example, and, and many, where is it, this one, I mean, you have this fuzzy search idea, let me just say that again. You want to, computing the added distance is expensive. So just by looking at the n-grams, you want to say, oh, they have so few n-grams in common, they can't be very similar. I don't have to compute the added distance. Yes, good idea. But now you need a formula. You need a formula so that in your code you can write, if not enough, then don't do it. And this formula you just can't guess, right? You have to do mathematics for this. This is how mathematics and uh, coding and, and great code come together. At some point, of course, you can even guess it and then run a thousand tests and see, oh yeah, it works most of the time, so this seems to work. Better do the mathematics, otherwise you just hack and tr trial and error, you shouldn't do that. So, all aspects we have also seen in this course, I just gave an example, we don't, there's a reason we use SVN for the course, of course for our project, it was not such a hot in the beginner class, it's always a big debate, you should use Git, not SVN. SVN has uh, authentication for individual subdirectories, Git doesn't have that, that's why we use it. <coughs> supervision, how does supervision work when you do a project or thesis with us? Again, it's similar to what you experienced. We gave you great sheet, we have great infrastructure, support, you can ask questions, you can even get an appointment. People rarely use that, you get great problems, inspiring environment. 
But then you just do it yourself, right? You get the sheet, you can ask questions, you work on it yourself on any time of the day or week. And uh, that's also how it uh, works in, in when you do a project or thesis. So let me be very clear, that's a double-edged sword. I mean, many people like that, or even they wouldn't do it without it. But there are also people who like prefer this step by step, now do this, now, I, I don't think we're the best group for for that. So if you really want this, tell me what to do next, tell me what to do next. Okay, but I, I understand that there are two kinds, there are always two kinds of people for everything. I think it's a great fit for two things. First, when you really like it, that what you do is useful and used by others, which in a university context is not the usual thing, so we do that a lot, it's like our core thing. And, and, and you like to get stuff done. And these two go together, right? When you're doing something for others, it's not just, oh, I thought about it, I have an idea, but you actually, you build something and then it works and you get it done. I think these two uh, belong together. So if you are that kind of person and, and you like the uh, demos, which I will show you in a second, then I, I think you will like working with us. And I want to mention, because I say you solve problems, whenever you do something you have to solve problems. Now that's the thing in academe, in some circles, also the circles I grew up with, it's very important that the problems are super hard. I don't believe in that, right? Science problems don't have to be, if they are hard, they are hard, if they are easy, they are easy. It's more important that you, it's useful, right? Maybe you are solving a useful problem, it's not that hard. Or you get some insight, or it's nice, that's important. Whether it's hard or not, it's secondary, I would say. I mean, it shouldn't be trivial or already existing, but it's, it's not the primary criterion that it's the hardest problem on Earth. And that's really different. So, for example, in the theory, I started with computer science theory, Almost the only yardstick is how hard is it. It's just constantly proving colleagues, I'm smart, I'm so smart, look, I came up with this. And it's like the opposite, whether it's useful or not, doesn't matter, it's how, how smart, proving, which is just different rules, so that's why I'm saying it. Those are our criteria, one of those. Okay, learning, you have seen learning in this lecture, so it's an important part and uh, yeah I mean learning has been around for a long time it wasn't that useful like 20 years ago now it is so because usefulness is important for us of course we also use it a lot you have seen a few learning algorithms fewer than last year where we had more so but language models we didn't have last year we very briefly say when you work with learning I mean, it's different, like you can't prove that you, it's not like in classical, uh, let me go back to this thing all the time, here I'm proving something. I've actually done the mathematics, when you use this formula, your algorithm will be correct. Think of the last exercise sheet, what I showed you here. Uh, now I'm, uh, I'm using this, now what? Can I prove that when I, I get a correct Sparkle query, this, you can't really prove things here. So is it completely trial and error? No, you have seen this in the lecture. We, we had, yeah, we had these uh, model functions and then we are differentiating some, we are computing the gradients, we are updating our weights using gradient descent because we want to find the, the, those weights where the loss, the difference to this thing we want to do is the smallest. So there's theory behind it and you need to understand it. Otherwise you're just randomly trying out stuff, which people do a lot with learning these days. I, I know that. I think 90% of people using these torch libraries, they just, okay, let me plug this together and see how it works. Of course, when you do this, you should understand uh, what you're doing. And then there are a lot of, that's also I think characteristic of learning, tricks of the trade, stuff you just, when you do this a lot, then you know, okay, here I should use that, uh, we have seen GELU in the last lecture, I shouldn't use the sigmoid function, RELU has its problems, 
and then something, my training doesn't really progress, the loss doesn't become smaller, maybe it's because a lot of these uh, experience, like when you're building stuff, you know, ah, oh, this could be this. But you have to know where it comes from, you have to know gradients, you have to know the math, otherwise it doesn't work. But very important, we also, we do both, and I believe in both. Some people say old, the old stuff will go away. I think that's completely wrong. And also, it's nice to do both, right? I mean, just plugging in networks, putting one layer up on the next, and then seeing whether it works. It's, it's not always the greatest fun on Earth, so it also has its downside. So this year, where yeah, if you implement it correctly, it works. If you have a bug, let me say this one thing, if you have a bug here, it just won't work. It will crash or give wrong results. If you have a bug here, it still works. That's the thing with a neural network. You do a, some of you experienced with the sheet, that with a sheet, I think. It doesn't work that well. Maybe you had a bug, but it still predicts the next word, just not as good as it could. So. That's, uh, if you have bugs, your program doesn't crash, just the quality goes down. That makes it a bit harder. But still, when you come and you want to do a project, you, I think you should kind of say, okay, I want to do learning stuff with natural language, then it's typically with natural language, or I want more classical stuff, and we have both. So just an overview of what we have in Freiburg. We have Frank Hutter, he does hyperparameter optimization, so more on the theoretical side. Hyperparameters are like the batch size, the context size in a language model, how many epochs do I train, the learning rate, I have the gradient, now how much do I go in the direction of the learning rate. These parameters are super important in practice and they try to learn them automatically, so meta-learning kind of theoretical, but very interesting, of course. We do text, Thomas Brox does vision, so everything with pictures, if you like that. Then there's Abhinav Valada, who does robotics, so the things and autonomous driving. Yoshka is doing neurorobotics, so things in conjunction with medicine, also autonomous driving. Then there are two colleagues who left us, and two new, so there will be one uh, c coming, doing something with AI and medicine, and Professor Nebel, he retired, foundations, there will be also someone new, and we basically do it with text, which is also, I mean, these are the big areas of AI, it's really pictures, vision, text, robotics, and then more specific stuff, right? These are the three big areas, stuff working around, text, and vision. And we also work together, so Sebastian actually works together with the vision people because text and images are a big thing now. Okay, so now some demos for the last part. I will not show all of them, I think I will show some of them, just so and I think when I click on the link here, this traditionally crashes. So I should do it like this. Yeah, so that's uh, by one of your tutors, Patrick. So that's an older thing, but I still like to do it. I'd like to show it. That should public transit on a map. And that's just, uh, okay, so now you have, where are we? That's Stuttgart, I think. So I can click here. You see a line. You'd see the vehicles going. You have, uh, so that's using real scheduled data, also real-time data. So now I sped it up a little bit. So here we have some delay, of course. <laughs> the cities are 53 minutes, oh my. Okay, let me slow it down a little bit. A lot of super interesting problems here. For example, one problem, this line here which you see is not in the data set. You just have the stations in the data set. They don't tell you what course the vehicle takes. So this course is computed by maximum likelihood vehicle. What's and it's actually very close usually to how it is in real. Because if you would just draw station, station and a straight line, it would look really strange. So it's drawing, yeah, if I go on anything here, you get like smooth, nice lines following the actual track data. 
and it's computed, it's learned using maximum likelihood. So a lot of things here. And of course, the nice thing here is it's also an algorithm and data structure thing. It works for the whole world. And you have all the components here. That's why I like to show it. It's, yeah, how do you get that it's so fast that you get the right data at every time? That's a data structure and algorithms thing. Then visualization, how you draw things on a map so that it's so smooth. And then, yeah, how do you do that in principle? So that's one nice thing. And uh, what else do we have? Let me let me show this. This is something. No, let me show. I think Sparkle first. Or oh, let me show this maybe. That's something Sebastian did. So that's a spelling correction with a. That's classical learning stuff. That's something Sebastian did for his uh, master's thesis. Let me just uh, put some text here with spelling errors. And now I correct it. Maybe that was not a good example because the text is, he complimented me on my new shirt. This is also a bad example, I guess. Endoplasmic. Endoplasmatic reticulum is part of the cell. Yeah. And let me maybe, let me do some, okay, let me do some, let me do some real time typing with a lot of mistakes. Okay. Not bad, right? Now, so you see the model is uh, fast. Uh, why don't I have this on my smartphone. Okay. Have to have, okay, I did a lot of mistakes here. Why don't I have this on my smartphone? Okay. So uh, you see the point, you're typing something, it gets corrected immediately. One must say that chat GPT or GPT models can also do these things, but try it. You can tell GPT. Please correct, uh, please correct stuff while I'm typing. Okay, so you see it makes uh, some mistakes, but in general it's really good. What it also can do, what's really hard, is correct a white space error. So I don't know about your phone, my smartphone totally sucks at this. Your error correction is just so bad, I don't understand it. So models, huge models like GPT can also do this, but they take forever, like it costs you one dollar to correct one sentence. And this is a model, you see it, it's live, I type it and, and it works. It's really good. And it's a surprisingly hard problem to this day. I mean, think of, I don't know, does anybody have great correction on their smartphone? I don't. My, my autocorrection sucks. So it's still a hard problem to this day. And I think it was a great project. So let me, clever, let's go to clever. I think I've already shown you this in the first lecture. Let me tell you. So that's one big project in our group where you can type uh, Sparkle queries. And we have done Sparkle. So for example, here, a largest city in, in Germany. Uh, ordered by size. That's Wikidata. Wikidata, we have worked a lot with Wikidata. It's almost 20 billion triples. You know what triples are, so I don't have to explain a lot. What's special about this engine is that it's uh, really fast, even on very big data. Give me, I think we did this first name thing, but let me just give me a first name again, just for the sake of example, a first name not too frequent, not too rare. You can also write it in the chat. A first name, in case that wasn't clear. A given name. Oh, I'm surprised that I don't get suggestions here. Oh, something is not working as it should. Helene, okay, Helene and the uh, Helena, Helen, Helena, Helena. Okay, let's that's all Helenes in Wikidata. We have nine hundred fifty seven of them, and now I get nine hundred fifty seven Helenes in Wikidata, their birthplace and 
uh, where that birthplace is, and then I can look at this on a map. So that's where the Helene is. I think I showed that query. And the first lecture here, there's another, there's also, we didn't work with OpenStreetMap, I think, in this lecture. Tell me, so there's also visualization aspect, any country, state of a country or large city, anything? Alaska. Alaska, okay, let's look at the streets in Alaska. All streets in Alaska. Here we have, okay, that's the, not a lot of streets in Alaska. Tell me another one, maybe with more streets. Hmm? Bangalore. Bangalore. A lot of streets in Bangalore. Okay. Bangalore, is it? Where's ba Okay, yes, two Bangalores. Rural, hmm. I take, yeah, that's probably surroundings of Bangalore. Okay. Ah, Bengaluru, okay, I think. I wonder, that was just on the. Let's see whether I get more here. Okay, yeah, that's uh, so if I zoom in here, I get the street network. If I go here, yeah. So that's a lot of uh, data, and you also get the visualization aspect here. So OpenStreetMap, that's 40 billion triples. You see, everything is really uh, fast. And let me show you a few meta things about, uh, let me show you one more thing. That's one thing we did recently. That's uh, just the reason, so this is ongoing. Uniprot is uh, all the protein data of the world. And this number, I, know, I mean nowadays, people say, yeah, that's just a number with 12 digits. It's 147 billion statements about which protein does what in which organism is coded by, has which amino acid sequence is coded by which gene is associated with which disease. It's just amazing. It's the complete protein gene uh, organism knowledge of the world. 147 billion triples compiled by humans over decades. It's just, and the data set is enormous. It's huge and it's not easy to query it. Let me try to query it. This is something we've been able to pull off only recently. Pull off because it's so big. Let me try it. I'm not. Let me look for some proteins. Okay. And what you also see here, it's also a lot of work. Is uh, okay. I get these suggestions. So I want proteins. Let's just look for all proteins. 416 million proteins, here are their names. And by the way, the nice thing here, let me just briefly mention it, these completions, they are also Sparkle queries. How do I get this list of completion? I type type and now I want to get possible types. And here I get protein relatively high up in the list. Actually, if I do F12, I will see, let me just check that. I think I have to go, I'm sorry, resources. I have to switch something on here. I have to tell this what to, let me show you this because that's interesting. Yes, here I have a query which I can. So this query, here's something commented out. This is again a Sparkle query, and when I execute it, it gives me, okay, I have to order it by, order by descending count. So now I get protein type, some type. I could also, I've written type here, that's just a generic variable name. And now just tell me how many of each type are there. So there are, uh, triples here, uh, 4.7 billion triples which have the type structured name. I mean, this is an amazing amount of data which I have here, right? And this query was uh, really fast. Let's do that query in the official Uniprot Sparkle engine. We can uh, plug it here. 
Let me check. Was it the right one? No, I, I want to do this one here. So they also have a Sparkle engine. If you, that's the official site of Uniport. Let me just. Uh, this is wheel is turning. I think it will be turning for a long time. So, hello Frank. I need five more minutes. So these should suggestions are again Sparkle queries sent to the backend. They go really fast. So let's uh, protein. What do we want? Now I want to know protein belonging to a particular organism. I don't want to specify the organism. Maybe I want to specify the super type. Like let's say, I don't know, what do we want? Coronaviruses maybe. Okay, this now takes a while. But it's, uh, okay, I want subclass of. I don't know why it went away. Subclass of, and I should be able to type something, and you see by this, okay, coronaviruses, okay, now I have proteins of coronaviruses, and now of the protein, maybe I want the sequence, the sequence of amino acids, and I think I need more information here, the sequence. Okay, so now I have, Okay, maybe I also want the name of the protein and the name of the organism. Let me also do that here. So I see I could take label here and I, for the organism. So maybe I don't know what the predicate is for to specify, so I can see it here. Oh, it's again disappearing, some bug. Scientific name sounds good. I think there was also another name, right? Short name, other name, common name. Let me take common name. Okay, and now I have, okay, so now I have a protein here of MERS, cough, Middle East respiratory, blah, blah. Here I have the sequence of amino acid in case you always wanted to know it. Let's see, do we find, oh, here's the spike. So here's the spike protein of MERS, cough, and here are amino acid sequence. And you can also find the gene sequence which encodes it. So, yeah, you can also see how useful it is and you want an engine which can search this really fast. Sorry, which helps you formulate these queries. One last thing, so I've shown you the visualization. A few more minutes. I have to go over time, otherwise you wouldn't recognize that it's me. A few more minutes, please. This is something Sebastian is working on at the moment. What you want is you want to enter a question in natural language like this. Let's just take in which city is Sans Souci. And let's, uh, let me just, you see it's a very, do I have to uh, run model? I'm pr I probably have to select the model first. Yeah, I have to select the model first. Okay, that's now a model which is trying to Given the question, it tries to learn the Sparkle query. So here it, it has the answer. So what it actually did is it learned the Sparkle query. Here's the Sparkle query which it learned. So this Sparkle query, if I execute it, I actually get uh, the right answer, Potsdam. So this says Sans Souci, P131 is located in uh, entity and the right answer is Potsdam. And the question is how do you learn that uh, from just the question? You type the question anyway, maybe a more complex question. I don't think I will go into the details now. The hard thing is we already saw our, saw our uh, toy language model. Even the toy language model could figure out like basic syntax, but how do you know that it's that uh, Sans Souci is Q151330. And so what the model is doing here, I don't have to ex time to explain this now, it's actually doing something intermediate. It's first predicting the entity via its label. So it's using its ability to predict text and then there's a separate mechanism which takes this, so there are some special tags here and then translates this into ID because you can't properly get a language model really to memorize all these IDs. We have seen this for Wikidata, there are so many of them, 
that just does not work. So yeah, a lot of people I think are working on that as at the moment, like question answering, you answer and you get questions on a big knowledge graph so that you don't, if you have such queries, you can just type in natural language what you want, then you get the, yeah, you just say, oh, give me all the amino acid sequences of coronaviruses. And then it gives you that query, you execute it and you get the result. Oh, by the way, this also came back in the meantime. So if you like uh, any of these demos and you, let me say, show you one more thing, I think, in the, uh, our GitHub. So that's our, no, I have to go to RD Freiburg. I'm almost done. So this is uh, our clever repository. So we do very sophisticated software development, I would say. I don't know how many groups do that. So of course we use continuous integration with a lot of uh, workflows here. So for example, if I click on this, then you see whenever you had something similar for the course, whenever you upload something here, commit, it does all kinds of, it checks the code coverage, how many, how many lines of your code were covered by tests. It builds it with a lot of compilers. It builds a Docker image automatically, tries it on different platforms, Mac OS. It does static analysis, static program analysis, what Podelsky and Thiemann do. So maybe it compiles, but maybe there are some subtle errors which you could find by analyzing the program. This is this, and uh, we do code reviews. And one, uh, there is this, I think if you did GitHub stars, isn't there a website on this in case you, oh yeah, star history. I don't know if you know this, that's nice. If you just enter, the URL of a GitHub repo here, you see how it does over time. Oh yeah, that's, so that's, uh, this is actually used by quite a few people now. So this is our Sparkle engine. You see it's doing quite well, nice graph here. So that's it, I think. Where's my slides? Going a little over time as usual. Okay, last slide, upcoming courses. So programming in C++ in the summer semester. So if you want to become a tutor, that would be great. That's the basic, the advanced programming course for all bachelor students of the faculty. So this I said, in two years, I will uh, give this again. In the next year, I will probably take my long overdue sabbatical. So the first issue of the advanced course will be 26, 27, if the world is still around. Last comment, and then we are really done. If you want to do a project or thesis with us, they are offered all the time. So you, yeah, there are no particular points in time. There are instructions on our wiki, how it works. Just read them and ask us. If you send, you can ask any of the people in my group. If you ask me, you get no response. It's never personal. Just ask again, please. Don't forget that. It probably just got lost in hundreds of emails uh, of that day. Just ask again and don't wait a week. If you don't get a reply in two or three days, ask again. Of course, it helps if you were in one of our lectures and showed a commitment. Otherwise, why would you want to do a project or thesis with us? Do you have any, so no new exercise sheet this week? Any more questions right now about anything? Oh, a bit over time, yeah. Yeah, there's the Rust Pro. Sebastian introduced Rust in our, so we do a lot of C++ and on the front end JavaScript and stuff. So we use the languages which are, which are fast and Rust is kind of the better C++. So yes, Sebastian is using Rust. The problem with Rust in one sentence is it's a great language. It's much better than C++, but for C++ you have all the libraries and what stuff people have developed for decades, which is still missing for Rust. But otherwise, Rust is the better language, no question. Any other? So you're welcome to program in Rust if you work with us, unless you want to collaborate on an existing project, which is in C++. Any other questions? 
Okay, so thank you very much. See you for the exam or any other time. Bye-bye.